Good morning. Welcome to Mount Vernon Place United Methodist Church in Baltimore, Maryland. Today is Sunday, May 12th, 2024. Happy Mother's Day. Our scripture lesson this morning is from the first psalm. Pastor Yost shares a message entitled, Searching for Resurrection Beyond Binaries. It is not that binaries aren't always helpful. We don't rely on them. But we can also feel the difference between those who are following empire and those who are not. It's less about who is a good person and more about who can we safely keep proximate to our movements. The stakes are too high. The empire's narrative and God's testimony must be distinguished so that we can distance ourselves from imperial influencer out of our love for all people. May we rightly discern potential threats without giving into disposability logics. May our way of categorization create space for murky middles and humanities comprised by colonized minds. We pray that this message this week blesses you and encourages you for the week to come. The first psalm. The truly happy person doesn't follow wicked advice, doesn't stand on the road of sinners, and doesn't sit with the disrespectful. Instead of doing those things, these persons love the Lord's instructions, and they recite God's instructions day and night. They are like a tree replanted by streams of water, which bear fruit at just the right time and whose leaves don't fade. Whatever they do, succeeds. That's not true for the wicked. They are like dust that the winds blows away. And that's why the wicked will have no standing in the court of justice, neither will sinners in the assembly of the righteousness. The Lord is intimately acquainted with the way of the righteous but the way of the wicked is destroyed. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Recording in progress. God, may your spirit find us here in this moment with open hearts. May you lead us in ways that bear your love in a world that seems so divided and vengeful. Amen. So for those that are familiar, uh, typically the way that I write sermons is I think a lot about the scripture for pretty much an entire week and then wake up Sunday morning and finally write down all of my thoughts. Um, this morning I woke up just a little bit earlier than planned um, to the beautiful little beep of a smoke detector. And in our house we have exactly three smoke detectors left that can do that. All of them are on the third floor. All of them are in bedrooms with a nice hallway that makes um, everything reverberate. And so whenever it first beeps we literally have no idea which room it's in or where to do it. Now I understand you're supposed to when the clock change, change all the batteries and then I would never have to deal with this. But I still um, like to save as much resources as possible, use the batteries until they die, and since we're there all the time, might as well just replace it when it's dead instead of replacing all of them a little too early. When we had our dog Trixie, this was a bit harder because um, her anxiety would make it so that she would then be panting in our face in the middle of the moment whenever it started to beep. So it became like an urgent response when we would first hear that first beep to make sure that the dog would settle and so that we could go back to sleep. Um, and for some reason, so I just laid there for like 15 minutes hoping that it would happen again so I could try to figure out where it is. But it, the first beep and the second beep were a good like hour apart. 
And so this whole time I'm thinking about like all of the anxiety of trying to figure out which one's which and then the dreaded just like I'm standing underneath of one, why don't they have lights that tell me which one's not working? so that I can see which one's beeping, because everything just reverberates. And so it's really easy for me to be like, whoever designed these things and thought it was a good idea to install them in my house was clearly wicked and needed to be destroyed in some way, shape, or form, because, I mean, the fancier smoke detectors are a lot more expensive, but I guess I only deal with this a little bit, um, like once a year-ish, so whatever, right? Now. It's easy for us to want to t label things as evil or wicked. Inconveniences seem to be things that we throw labels at. But even more seriously, we run into these divides in our world. We have Democrats versus Republicans, where pretty much most of each party thinks the other one is the true version of evil. Even when we're looking at our current Democratic elections, in like just the Democratic primaries that happened on Tuesday, also Brooks versus Trone. Trone took a recent turn in the past couple weeks to be as vicious as he could in order to try to guarantee a win because it's a very close Senate race between the two of them. And then if we look at how we talk about things when it comes to Israel versus Hamas, people tend to take sides labeling the other side as the evil one, the wicked one, and their side as the righteous one. But the reality is, in each of these circumstances, there's a lot more nuance that can be applied. And that nuance is a lot harder than it seems. It's really hard to unpack why people would be, if you're pro-Palestine, why would people ever want to defend the further colonization of Israel when we want to understand that people that are Jewish have the right to self-determination just like those that live in Palestine and were there before the Nakba. And in the same sense, looking at the pure evil deeds of Hamas, You'll sometimes hear people say that everyone, all of the Palestinians, are evil because of the fact that they support Hamas, when in reality, that election was in 2008. And I can understand the desire for a violent reaction to oppression that has lasted nearly a hundred years. Our passage today presents two categories, the truly happy person, which they later refer to as righteousness or righteous, versus the wicked. Now, you might be like me. When I first saw that this was one of the lectionary texts, I was determined if I'm doing this sermon series on searching for resurrection, like clearly I should avoid Psalm 1. Like where is the resurrection and the strong binaries presented here? Let me look at all of the other texts and see if any of them are more useful at trying to get to a different point than I've, one I've already made. Because so much of this righteous versus wicked we see unfolding over the past 50 plus years in the United Methodist Church and how people would talk about LGBTQIA individuals. This language of judgment for the wicked and happiness for the righteous was a bit triggering for me, and so I definitely understand if it was for you too. The important question to ask is who is defining righteous and wicked here? And then also, who are we allowing to define the righteous and wicked? Now, within the text, is it, are, when they talk about the law, are they talking about Psalm? Like, is it really talking about uh, Leviticus? Well, the reality is Psalm 1 was written probably well before the entire Hebrew Bible was actually compiled. The Hebrew Bible was compiled together once the nation of Israel was in Exodus, well, in exile in Babylonia. So maybe not that. So the question is, is it laws in general? But the reality is if we look at the laws of the time, it was perfectly lawful for Jesus to be executed. And the laws of modern eras, it was perfectly lawful for the Holocaust to be implemented. And actually it was illegal to resist the Holocaust. In the same way that chattel slavery was completely legal and later segregation. So maybe it's not the laws that are the things that we should actually be using to define wicked and righteous. So the next best guess, the religious community or the church. 
Well, if we look at the Church Universal, they're the same institutions that upheld these lawful institutions of slavery and segregation and the Holocaust. And with our own tradition, spent over 50 years intentionally harming folks when we're just talking about the LGBTQIA people, and then the harm that was done by our central conference and the segregation within our own institution makes it so maybe that's not the immediate laws that we should be always paying attention to. So if we lean into the text just a little bit more, Psalm 1 was likely written by King David. And if we know King David well enough, we talk about him being a man after God's own heart, but he also was pretty good at abusing his power. He was both abused and abuser, so he lived with the knowledge that righteous and wicked weren't necessarily clear, binary groups of people, but that righteousness was a daily choice, a choice to live connected with the love of God. Or as Gray Oletza, the Nairobi-based poet and a contributor for In Flesh says, a life guided by love is prosperous because life is nurtured by love. Going back to verse 1, the truly happy person doesn't follow wicked advice. It doesn't stand on the road of sinners and doesn't sit with the disrespectful. And sometimes, since I completely missed National Poetry Month because Frank was right, it was April and I was completely off and I don't know why I ever thought it was February. But to make up for it, Poets are brilliant at finding the levels of details that we never necessarily expanded to. And so, Gray Oletza helped me discover the poetic language of this psalm in particular and how it invites us to see how we can pursue righteousness. They write, The poetic language of the psalms covers this principle through its mention of the path of sinners and the seat of scorners. The path is a habitual route used to travel towards a specific destination. The seat is a place of resting, comfort, and authority. The righteous person in the Psalms is divested of these institutions because he understands that these modes of living are disconnected to substance, that force, which is life, perpetuating life. Notice that the righteous aren't necessarily expected to completely avoid doing bad things, but they are truly happy because they remove themselves from the habitual routes and comfort of living in ways that don't produce love. We will all fall short on this journey. We all need grace from God and from each other. What matters most is that we are ready to be graceful with each other and ourselves, and also to make sure that when we fall, we are falling towards liberating love. Gray Oletza breaks this down a little bit more with interpretations for the path of sinners and seat of scorners. I believe the path of sinners to be a habitual frame of mind that translates into a habitual way of living. If repentance is a transformation of the mind towards life and grace, the path of sinners is a stagnation towards decay and denigration. The path of sinners appears to be oriented around a labyrinth formation. Its purpose is not to lead to life or truth, but to confuse and to exhaust resources. It pairs well with the seat of scorners. The seat of scorners addresses the denigration that flows from a system where the mindset of one meant to lead people into missing the mark. If people are constantly so afraid of being scorned, of having any honest attempt at life-giving behavior ridiculed, then of course they will turn away quickly from that path. So as we pursue lives that are truly happy, we seek to be connected with God's love while strengthening and resourcing each other through our commitment to the liberating love of God. And to doubly make up, let's talk about multiple poets in one service since I missed it so bad. Gwendolyn Brooks wrote a poem about Paul Robeson, who was living a life of resistance to oppressive institutions which restricted him as a black man in the 50s from using his law degree, from performing as an actor and singer because of his activism, and all of this because of his pursuit of more just laws and ways of living. Gwendolyn Brooks was so inspired by his life, she wrote the, book, the poem, Paul Robeson. 
That time, we all heard it, cool and clear, cutting across the hot grit of the day, the major voice, the adult voice, foregoing rolling river, foregoing tearful tale of bale and barge and other symptoms of an old despond, warning in music words, devout and large, that we are each other's harvest. We are each other's business. We are each other's magnitude and bond. So church, how do we live in ways that show that we are each other's harvest, business, magnitude, and bond? How do we live in ways so that sinners feel they can stand with us just like they felt com comfortable in the presence of Jesus? For many people that society and the church has labeled as sinners in the past, within this community, that's the easy part. But if we keep in mind the path of sinners which upholds unjust systems, I don't think those sinners are too interested in spending much time with us. The ones that are more committed, committed to their journey towards nationalism. And I think that begins with us remembering that what the mystics called the illusion of separation. You may recall a few months ago when we talked about Howard Thurman, he talked about deeply meditating on God, and when he went down into the depths of his being, he came back up, noticing that we were all connected through the same root system to one another, that we are each other's magnitude and bond, business and harvest. It is only after we realize that we are divinely connected to those we more instinctively call the enemy that we can even begin to connect with them in, the real, path, in real life, to see them as humans, to listen to them, do life with them, and then walk the path of liberating love with them. Some of you may have already heard that I grew up in St. Mary's County. St. Mary's County, Maryland is not necessarily the most liberal part of the state. I actually grew up being told that the prison that is Point Lookout was a Confederate prison, not for Confederate prisoners. So the Confederacy was a part of the culture and life and heritage that I grew up in. I grew up in a town where white supremacy was the reigning way of talking and moving through the world. And yet somehow I've spent 13 years at the castle on the hill, learning from black youth that would have never been close to me when my own upbringing kept me in segregated classes. While I went on a bus that was desegregated, we went to different class levels as soon as we entered the building. The tracking that had been built into our school system ensured that segregation still thrived. At some point in our lives, we all needed someone to guide us toward God's liberating love. So we get to be that for one another as we keep falling towards liberation. So let me close with this prayer from Gray Oletza. O oh, sweet balm of harvest, help us see each other through from one season into the next. O oh, steadfast guard of business, guide us through grace to your gentleness. Help us stand confidently in the light of truth. O oh, brilliant magnitude, O oh, bond of our bonds, give us your bigness out of your bountiful generosity and give us your love that pursues and holds throughout the ages. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. If the people of Mount Vernon Place United Methodist Church may be of service to you, please email us at mvpumc. Baltimore at gmail.com. But for now, may the Lord bless you and keep you until we can meet again. God be with you.